Welcome to uh, Hillside Community Church. For those that are visiting this morning, we're glad to have you with us and for the regular attenders. Glad that you're here uh, to start out the, the fall. And, um, you know, we've been going through different series uh, over the summer. Um, I went through uh, the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And um, last week was the final message in that series. And this week, um, I'm going to be launching into a, a new series. And I've been praying about this. And, and I, I just feel it laid on my heart to, uh, to go through the book of 1st Thessalonians. So that's uh, the direction that we're going to be taking uh, for the next while. And uh, so let's just bow in prayer before we uh, open the word this morning. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, God, that we gather here together in your name and that you've called each one. God, we thank you that we live in a country that's, that's free, that we can preach your word without hesitation, Lord, and that there's, there's very little in the way of persecution against us. And we don't want to take that for granted, Lord, because we know that uh, we live in a world of sin. And, and we just thank you, Father. Thank you for the blessing of freedom. And thank you for the, fa- for the fact that we can... Uh, we can go to your word, Father, for all that we need because you have provided it, Lord. By your grace, God, you have given us everything we need for life and godliness in you. And Lord, for those that are here this morning that are heavy laden and, and burdened, God, I just pray that you would bring a rest to them, Lord. And that if there's folks here or listening online, God, that don't know you or who are struggling in their walk with you, God, I just pray that your spirit would just minister even now. As we open the word, God, may my lips be fruitful and may they be in obedience to your spirit as I I go through the scriptures this morning. And we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Thessalonians. I think a couple of months ago I, I did a series on Second Thessalonians, but we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, the backdrop to wh- wh- where we're going to be going, and I think it's important for us to understand the context for the scripture that we're going to be uh, speaking about, or speaking through, or walking through, I should say. Um, so sometime in AD 51, they believe, um, the, the Apostle Paul, Silas, and Timothy, um, they were traveling through uh, the province of Asia and in Rome and, uh, and Macedonia on their second missionary journey. And after leaving the city of Philippi, they came to the city of Thessalonica. Um, now, for those who are not aware, Thessalonica was a seaport city and was the capital of the Roman province of Macedonia in that day. And upon Paul's missionary uh, team arriving there, um, they stayed for a while and uh, not for a long, uh, they planted a church, and, they, and it wasn't too long after they planted the church that there were some angry people uh, that rose up against Paul and chased them out of Thessalonica, and they went on to Berea, and then to Athens, and then to Corinth. So they kind of made this journey. I'm going to show you a map a little bit later just to show kind of where we're at as we get into the scriptures, but um, yeah, uh, so Timothy had been working with Paul, and Paul had, had sent Timothy to go and check on this church in Thessalonica because uh, he's, he was very uh, concerned about what might be taking place there. And Timothy went and found that there was many, many good things that were happening in this place. And he brought great report back to Paul. And um, Paul was so encouraged uh, that, uh, yeah, he, he wanted to write a letter, and, and the Spirit of God laid it upon him to write an inspired word that um, is with us to this day, because although this letter was written to the Thessalonian church of that era, it is still applicable to us today. There, it was set as a template uh, of, of truth, just like the other books in the Bible. They're set as templates for truth for us to, to dig into and to learn through, and um, yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be starting into this, so without further ado on that, um, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Thessalonians, uh, chapter 1, and you can follow along on the overhead if you'd like, or on your phone, or with your Bible, your own Bible in your hand, um, but we're going to be going through the first three verses to start. 
Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So when, when you read that, I don't know if you can feel it, but the affection for this church is coming very clearly through from the Apostle Paul. He was so thankful for what God had done in establishing this church. And originally when Paul had planned his missionary journey, his second missionary journey, he actually had not intended to be in Macedonia. Paul had other ideas. He thought that he would like perhaps to travel throughout the vicinity of the Roman province of Asia. And in fact, he did go through Asia, but not at this particular time. You see, God had other plans. And God in his sovereignty, when he decides to do something, he never does it without good reason. And we can bank that. And sometimes when we get frustrated with life, when we start to look at things that are not happening the way we thought they should happen, we tend to get frustrated and we begin to wonder what is going on. And maybe is God even there? Is he there? Why doesn't he do this that I think he should be doing? But God sometimes has different plans than we have because God in his eternal nature, knows the beginning and the end and everything in between, and he knows what's right, and he knows how to put it together. And such was the case in this particular setting. You see, Paul had the right heart. He wanted to go through the province of Asia to build on what had already been built and to try and establish new beachheads in, in the province of Asia. A very noble thing, I think. God, God's word being promoted, God's word being, uh, being shared, the possibility of people acknowledging Jesus as their Savior, all great motives. He had the right motive. But that wasn't the plan of God in the timing of God. So let's look at how Paul actually came to arrive in Thessalonica. I'm going to uh, read the scriptural account. I'm not going to have this on overhead because I'm going to show you a map so you can follow along. Now, I don't know if that's clear. Maybe if I could get uh, Dion, if you could shut the light on the front there, the front couple of lights off from the other side there, yeah. Oh, the other side. Sorry. There you go. That's right. Okay. Can everyone see that? I don't know if it's clear enough. Okay, so um, I'm going to read to you um, the story of how Paul um, started his second missionary journey. Now, Paul and his companions, it says, in the book of Acts, chapter 16, um, starting with verse 6 through to verse 10, um, it says this, Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phygria and Galatia. And that's kind of like, boy, I wish I had a pointer. Eh, I can't reach it. Oh boy, forget that. Okay, you see Galatia there? Well, just below there is uh, Phygria. That's where he started. So, so they traveled through the region of Phygria and Galatia having been kept. Now listen to this. Okay, They were preaching the gospel. They were doing the will of God. But they were kept, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. They are kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching in Asia. When they came to the border of Mycia, and you see it kind of up in the far corner there, you're looking at the modern-day country of Turkey here. That's the centerpiece of the map right here is the modern-day uh, country of Turkey. And then off to uh, your left, that peninsula that comes down, that's modern-day Greece. Okay, so when they came to the border of Mycia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to do so. 
So they passed by Mycenae, and they went to Troas, which is like right at the ancient port of uh, Troy, the ancient city of Troy. You guys have heard stories about Troy. That's kind of where that is right there, Troas. Okay? So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So you see, Paul walking in step with the Spirit of God, God intervened, and even though Paul had things in his mind that he figured that needed to be done, God shifted his gears and made sure that he was absolutely clear on the mission that he had for him to be uh, doing in the timing that he had for him to be doing it. And you know, sometimes in our lives too, God has missions for each one of you as believers. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are not your own. You're paid with the precious, with, for a price. You're paid with a price. Okay? For the, the precious blood of Jesus has bought you. You're not your own. That means... You're a servant of God. If you're a born-again Christian, a believer that has come to know Jesus as your Savior and the Spirit of God has come into your heart, He leads you. He guides you. You're not your own. And God takes you and He places you in certain places for certain reasons for certain seasons, just like He did with the Apostle Paul. We are no different. Yes, Paul had a very specific ministry. He's the, the Apostle to the Gentiles, a very specific ministry. But don't kid yourself. You are precious in the eyes of God, and you have a place in the kingdom of God in his church. And you have been placed in a certain place because God has a mission that he desires you to involve yourself with that he wants to work with you on. See, God doesn't need any of us, but he calls us because he wants us to be his children and to step with him in his good work. There's a community all around us that doesn't know Jesus. And God has you guys planted in different places throughout this community because he's called you. And who he calls, he equips. He gives you what you need. So getting back to where we are here, Paul didn't think about going to Macedonia until God prompted him to do so. So then they went into Macedonia. First place they went to is Philippi, and you'll see that if they, with the arrows crossing from Mycenae over to Macedonia. Philippi is the first city they, they went to, and then from, from Philippi, they went on to Thessalonica, and that's the setting of the book, is in Thessalonica, port city. It was the capital of the, of the province of Macedonia. So, yeah, Timothy had um, given such good reports of what was happening, that it was such an encouragement to, to the Apostle Paul. Paul was excited to see that they were continuing in what was good, and, and you know, even though he had been chased out of that region, and he was concerned that maybe they would come under the same sort of, of persecution, I'm sure he was, and, and in fact, the, the scriptures that we're going to read show that they were. Those people didn't buckle. They didn't buckle under it. They actually flourished. They actually grew in their faith and their knowledge of Christ. And, and uh, there was a beautiful thing that was taking place. See, they truly accepted God and his salvation plan by grace through faith. Jesus Christ died for their sins. They took that internally and they opened their hearts to the gospel and they became alive. And it wasn't just that they were functioning in Thessalonica and doing okay because they had heard some words and they had taken the words to heart. No, it was more than that. They took the words to heart, but the Holy Spirit brought those words to life in power. <laughs> Something powerful was taking place here. And because of this, the Thessalonians had been doing good works, prompted out of both love 
for God and love for the other people that he had planted them in the circles of. Jesus placed certain people in their lives and that love was shining forward. Now, God places you in circles and he has given you the same spirit as the apostles. We're standing here today as benefactors of the gospel going forward into the four corners of the earth. You are a beneficiary of this. Isn't that awesome? Like, this this all started from Jesus calling the first disciples. And then the foundation is laid with Jesus as the cornerstone and the apostles and the prophets of old being the foundation for the church. And you are living stones built into that building of the church that rises forth and gives praise to God collectively and individually, living stones together. Wow, what a beautiful picture. But you see, as his servants in this assembly, we've been gathered from many different places. You, most of us haven't originated in 100 Mile. Is there anyone here that was actually born in 100 Mile? Yeah? Uh, raise some hands. Who was born in 100 Mile? Okay. <laughs> Look around. Not very many. <laughs> Not very many of you are actually from 100 Mile. And if you are, you're probably, your parents had come from somewhere else and you were born here because they moved here, right? We, we come from different places. And God has a plan for us being gathered together from many different places. And he desires us, like the Thessalonians, that we come to that place of open-hearted acceptance of God's grace through faith. And when that happens, folks, and our hearts have been opened, the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead and seated Him at the right hand of the Father in in the heavenlies, that same power of the Spirit of the living God lives inside of the hearts of you, his people. You are the church. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you're the church. And every one of you is a part of it. And God desires that like the Thessalonians, we love one another and that we do good. You see the the Paul's commendation of them? They were loving God. They were loving one another. They were doing good. And the people of the community, because of their faith, were given eternal life as God's beloved children. And you know something? You, as believers in Jesus Christ, have been given eternal life. And it starts right here and right now because when God takes away your sin and he moves inside, he gives us the Holy Spirit who is the down payment, guaranteeing what is to come. That's exciting. I'm not my own. The Spirit of God lives within me, and he's guaranteeing what is to come. That's the down payment. That's the deposit. And the deposit that we have here isn't the full McCoy. There is much more, much more glory. The eye has not seen, nor has the ear heard, nor has it even entered into the mind of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. My friends, there is hope in Jesus Christ. There is hope in a relationship with him. Don't be discouraged out there in your corners. God is with you. He has promised that he would not leave you or forsake you. He will be with you to the very end of the age. You can take that at his word because his word is truth. Amen. Could I get the lights turned back on there? So Paul continues in verse 4 saying, he says this, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. 
And God knows the hearts of his people. He knew certain people in Thessalonica would have fertile ground in their inner being. He knew that. And he knew that that fertile ground would produce good fruit if the seed of his word were planted inside of them. They were chosen. Why? Because God saw them and he knew them from the beginning of time. He sent Paul, Silas, and Timothy as his envoys, his servants, to help bring to fruition what he had planned because he wanted them to participate with him in his good work. Paul reminds them in this letter that it's not just because that he, Silas, and Timothy had something special in themselves or were something special in themselves. They were servants of God, saved by his grace, just like everybody else. But God purposed to use them to bring his genuine gospel to the people of Thessalonica, and he prepared the ground in advance for them to go to. God has ground prepared for his servants ahead of them. And when you pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, you're praying that God would lead you and that you would be open to, to, to hear what he says and that you would be stepping in obedience to his, his voice and his call. And he puts you in that place that you're supposed to be in. You know, it wasn't just with good sounding words and teachings that they brought, but the gospel came to those people in Thessalonica, in power. The Holy Spirit was working in power and there was deep conviction. Remember when Peter spoke to the crowds in the first sermon in the book of, of Acts, in the second chapter of Acts, he spoke. What does it say about the people that he was speaking to? They were cut to the heart. They weren't cut to the heart by Peter. They were cut to the heart because Peter was a herald of God and the Holy Spirit fell upon those people and cut their heart and rendered them. This is how God's word goes forward. So, the Apostle Paul was assured that these saints had been chosen by God. You see it right there, right? He says, for you know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. In fact, Paul in his letter to the Ephesians reveals that all saints of God, anyone who comes to Jesus, is foreknown by God when he, before he created the universe. Paul in his letter to the Ephesians reveals that all saints of God were predestined to be conformed to his image before the foundation of the world. In Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 5, Paul stated this. He says, he's speaking to the Ephesians, but the same principle applies to all the churches. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. See, Paul knew the Thessalonian believers were among the elect. Why did he know that? He knew that because of the way they received the gospel. They received the gospel with open hearts. And they were converted by the indwelling Holy Spirit who came. After Jesus cleansed them from sin because of his sacrificial offering on the cross, the Holy Spirit came in and made his home inside of them. And that was the stamp of God's spirit, of God's election, you might say, on them. And the same is true for us today gathered in this assembly. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about this. And this has been a controversial subject over the centuries. I'm going to talk about the doctrine of election because that's where... The scripture says, you were chosen. Paul says, you were chosen to the Thessalonians. The doctrine of election teaches that God has certain people chosen because before he created the universe, he foreknew the outcomes. 
But the Bible, I, I want you to be very clear about this. I'm going to talk about this. Um, I don't think the Bible teaches at all that if God chose some to be saved, that he chose others to be lost. I, I think if we go that direction, we're misunderstanding something. I'm going to explain. You see, I don't believe the Bible teaches that he chose some people to be lost. If men are finally lost, it's not because God has willed it, but it is because of those people's own sin and unbelief. See, God the Father foreknew from all of eternity past and all eternity future. He knew what was going to happen when he created the world and everything in between to the time when this world present, the Bible says it's going to be destroyed by fire and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth that's going to be created. He knew, he knows the outcomes, he knows everything. There's three things about God that every believer needs to understand. God is not like us. He is not limited in knowledge. He is omniscient. He knows all things. There is nothing that is hidden from his sight. He is omniscient. He is also not limited in his power. You and I only have limited power to do certain things, certain times, in certain places. We are limited, but God is not limited. He's omnipotent, which means unlimited power. And also, he is omnip om omnipresent, which means he can be in more than one place at once. We don't understand that because we're limited by these two legs and two arms to be in one place at one time. God is not like us. He is omnipresent. He can be in you and in me at the same time. Why? Because he's omnipresent. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's not just some ambiguous force out there. The person of God dwells within his people. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. It's beautiful truth. Kind of bends your mind a little bit, doesn't it? It should. The vastness of the Creator cannot be comprehended by the little ones that he created completely. Yeah, we can glimpse at it, we can grow in our knowledge of it, but we're not going to understand the fullness of the knowledge of God. Because why? We are not God. We are not God. You're not God. God is above us. And there's, a, there's some people out there that preach the message, you are all like, you know, you're all like making your own destiny and you're in control of your destiny. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Everyone's truth is everyone else. It is not necessarily anyone else's truth. That's, that that's defies everything that exists as far as laws go. No. There is only one truth. And anything outside of the real truth is a lie. There's only one way to God. There's not, not many pathways that lead to God. One way to God through Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. He's the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way unto the Father. It doesn't matter where, what, where, what religion you're digging into. It's a false religion if it's not focused on Jesus Christ. So, folks, we can't partner with that. If we're believers in Christ, we're, we're true believers in Jesus, we have to separate ourselves from that. You can't worship God and, and demons at the same time. There's only one way to God through Jesus Christ, and that's never going to change, because that is the truth. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's what the scriptures say. Okay, so let's talk about election a little deeper. God the Father foreknew us from eternity, but it was up to us whether or not we would yield to Christ. I believe that has to be. To illustrate this point of God's election and the free will of man and how they are working together, we look into the book of Acts. There's a great story in the book of Acts that kind of brings this together. Um, in Acts chapter 27, reading from verses 21 to 26, I'm just going to go to a story there. The setting was that Paul and his, and his companions, um, soldiers, sailors, other prisoners, he was a prisoner on a, on a ship heading for Italy, heading for Rome. 
And Paul had cautioned them to not venture further in the winter months because it was a stormy season and he, he knew that they were going to be going into peril. So he, 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 he tried to discourage the people that were in charge of the ships, of the ship, not to go, but they didn't listen and they went. So while they were en route through to Italy from, uh, from Caesarea, and uh, that's where it started out, and they went through, uh, Caesarea is on the coast of Israel. I don't know if it was on that map, it doesn't matter. It's a port city with a head, beach head for the Roman, um, the Roman uh, regime in Israel, in that land. So they were on route from Caesarea to Italy, and they made certain stops along the way. And while they were on, the, on this journey, um, they, uh, they started on the leg of the journey, and this tremendous storm blew up. A fierce storm. Now, everything was being tossed all over the place, and the sailors who were experienced with this kind of thing, they... Start, they started to toss their cargo off the ship because they believed that they are going to sink if they didn't do something. So they tried to lighten the load. So they were tossing all the cargo off the ship. And everything was not going well. It seemed like everything would be lost and all the people on board would drown. And while this was happening, God decided to let Paul know what his plans were. And he did so by sending an angel to speak with Paul. So in verse 21 of Acts 27, after they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves and this damage, this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of 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 the God whom I belong and whom I serve beside me said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some islands. So Paul was given insight by God through this angel of what was going to transpire. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. God told him through this angel what would happen. This part of the story illustrates God's foreknowledge and his election. Everyone in that ship would be brought through safely. They would all make it to Italy and none would be lost. Set in stone. If God says it, set in stone, right? We can trust it. But after a little while, the sailors began to get nervous because the storm was not coming. It was raging and they had heard all the stories, I'm sure, from their childhood and had probably lost friends if they were in that trade for long to storms. They didn't trust what Paul was saying and and Paul noticed that the sailors were getting a boat ready. They're preparing to launch out the sea, putting provisions in it, getting ready to leave the ship. Well, Paul noticed this, and then he goes to, uh, to the centurion who is in charge, and he says to him in Acts 27, 30, and 31, he says this, In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors left the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending that they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Didn't he just say that no one would be lost? That's what God told him. But now here he is saying, unless you stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So there's a choice here. There's a free will choice for these guys to listen to the word that God had given to Paul or to disregard it. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. So in fact, what God had promised came to pass. But there was an an aspect of man's free will involved submitting to what God had commanded. This section of the story represents the free will of man. You see, 
They were responsible to see that no one had left the ship, and the same is true with the doctrine of election and man's responsibility. Everyone who is saved will be in heaven. They have, in fact, been chosen by Christ before the foundations of the world. In fact, the Lord God created the universe as it is for the sake of His chosen ones. Did you know that? He created things into their being for, for the sake of His elect. Why? Because in His sovereign plan, God wants to gather wheat into His barn and you're the harvest of righteousness that He wants to be with Him forever having eternal life forever with Him. Every human being who has ever been saved will go to heaven. And they're there because a guilty sinner has placed their personal trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Before he put the world and everything into motion, God foresaw, he, he, he foresaw, I should say, all who would put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he prepared ahead of time a means by which the sin of those people which separated man from him, he, he foreknew this, he, he prepared a way ahead of all of that for a way for humanity to be brought back to himself and reconciled to himself. You see, the redemption of humanity through Jesus Christ was not an afterthought. It was not just something where God said, oh, gee, i got to do something about this, you know. I can't, I don't know what to do. Uh, well, maybe I'll do this. Maybe I'll, I'll come down as a, as a, as, as, as a man and, and, uh, and I'll become the God-man who will give himself as a sacrifice for all these people and they'll be saved. He wasn't scratching his head going, I don't know what's going to happen here. No. You see, God is omniscient. He knows all things before they happen. This blows our mind. It does, and it should, because it's amazing. But this is the teaching of Scripture. You see, God isn't limited. He doesn't put in a box. He can't be put in a box by man. He knows all things. When God decided to bring creatures into existence that would give him a voluntary love and service, it was all part of his plan. You see, God could have made us as men and women who would never fail him. But he determined to create a man and a woman who could, who could give him a voluntary obedience. And why is that? Why? Why? Did he not make people with pre-established, pre-ordained obedience? Because, my friends, that would not bring the same depth of relationship that he desired. Love must have a choice. It must have a choice. You cannot force someone to love you. You can't orchestrate it so that people are forced to love you. Because that's not true love. True love must look at the other person and say, I choose to love you in return for the love that you've shown to me. God first loved us. He first loved us. And we respond by reciprocating that love as he calls us. Yes, is the beckoning strong? Absolutely it is strong. There is a pull on us by the Holy Spirit like none other when we come to Christ. If, if you have been walking in darkness, and you come to Jesus Christ, there is this pull on your heart, the conviction that comes from the weight of the Holy Spirit's voice in you saying, you must repent. You must turn away from your sin. You must walk towards me. There is that compulsion. But you still have a choice. You can harden your heart against the voice of God. 
Now, in Romans 8, 29, the scripture says this. For those who God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. That is so true. Those scriptures ring true, but that predestination does not mean that God made his elect to be preconditioned robots. We're not preconditioned robots. Who would, and there's this, I know there, this has been taught in many places throughout the years that the drawing of God is irresistible without the choice to resist him. The Spirit draws. And there's this irresistible draw to him that you can't say no to. Um, I don't think that that perception is correct. I think that draw can be resisted. And I think the scripture, if you look at it as a whole, teaches that. If you take the entire Bible in context, I know I'm stepping on some pretty crunchy issues here because this has been taught. Well, let's look at the Word because ultimately the Word of God tells us what the truth is. See, the Spirit draws. The ultimate thing is that the Lord ultimately knows who will come to Him. He knows who you are before you were even born. He knew that you would accept and bow your knee to Him before you even were thought of in this, in this context. Before time began, he knew you. But it cannot be irresistible grace that draws us. For how could God want the whole world to be saved? How could he want the whole world to be saved and send his son to die for the whole world, but only select a certain elect few by irresistible grace? Because if there's irresistible grace to draw you to him, then there is absolutely no hope for anyone who does not possess that irresistible grace. You see what I'm getting at here? God is not, folks, if you look at the context of Scripture, God is not a tyrant. He's not. He doesn't, he isn't a tyrant who makes the majority of people without choice to be consumed by the hell, hellfire. That's not our God. That's not who He is. This is not predestination and election and action. For how could God want the whole world to be saved and, and come to repentance as, as suggested in 2 Peter 3.9? And I know there's been some people who've said, oh, that's just, you've got to take the other scriptures. And Yes, we do. Well, let's look at this. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is being patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. See, God sent his son into the world not just for those who have irresistible grace to draw them. That he sent his, his son into the world for the entire world. Every man, woman, and child has opportunity to come to Jesus Christ as their Savior. The scriptures teach us in John chapter 3, uh, verse 16, we all know this scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. God loved the world. And I think sometimes we forget, we unhinge that from the next verse. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is truth, my friends. If you look at the nature of God, you can't separate the two. There can't be this schizophrenia in the Word of God where God is good, and then all of a sudden you have a God that is acting in a way that, quite frankly, appears to be unjust because He's just. Now, I know there's a lot of different arguments about this, and, and we could, I could preach 10 sermons on this topic. Now, it's true. In Psalm 115, verse 3, it's written, Our God is in heaven, and he does whatever pleases him. 
It's also written in Psalm 135, verse 6. The Lord does whatever pleases him in the heavens and the earth, in the seas and all their depths. This speaks to the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. He decides what happens. He decides how it all plays out. And there's nothing that anyone, any, any created being can do to change that. He rules over all. But this does not mean that God chooses to be tyrannical. Forcing people into a pre-constructed mold without any choices. I think that would be unjust. If someone is a, is, is, is a sinner, and we're all sinners, we deserve death. The penalty of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because of the love of God for the whole world, he gives the option for people to hear the voice and to respond to it and to repent. He gives that choice because he is just. He is good. What people do with that choice is up to them. He's not going to force them. But the choice is there. And ultimately, does God know what choices people will make? Yes, he does from the beginning of time. I, I said this to our Bible study group here. that A good way of looking at it is, is this. Um, picture yourself as part of the created universe right now. Just picture yourself. Look at your, look at your hands. You're alive. You've been given life by the Creator God. All of us here have. We're all here together. We're living in this environment. The world spins. The gravitational forces are there. Everything is as it is right now. We're part of this universe. God didn't have to create the universe with the outcomes that, that he has. He didn't have to create the universe like that. There are innumerable other ways that the universe could have unfolded. There are innumerable ways. Do you think that God is short-sighted? No, I don't. We can't think that God's short-sighted. He sees it all. So that means when he sees it all, he created the universe just as he intended it to be. No different. He didn't miss something along the way. He created it exactly how it is supposed to be. Why? Because it was part of his sovereign plan that many sons come to glory. And this plan that is in play right now that you're part of, that you're sitting in, was his ultimate plan. And out of all the innumerable universes that could have been in the past and in the future, this is the one that brings the most souls into his barn, into his harvest. Why? Because he loves the world and he does not wish that any should perish. He loves the world and he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Jesus. Because God is good and God is the epitome of love. This is truth, my friends. This is truth. And we've got to watch out. I've met so many people who are so discouraged because they have loved ones that appear not to be the elect. And they get so discouraged. What am I going to do? I can't do anything at the mercy of God. Yes, you are. You know what? You can pray for him because God puts you in the universe that you're in because he has a plan. So while there is life, while there is breath, there is hope for those people. We don't know who is elector. So we obey the Lord. We share the love of God with the people around us, with the people that we love. And we pray for them. God hears the prayers of his people. He chooses to move through the prayers of his people. Don't be discouraged, my friend. Don't be dismayed. The, the Lord loves you and he loves the people that are in your life around you. He is compassionate. He is a great God. To illustrate this, I just want to say that this thing that I'm talking about, there's many scriptures that kind of meld with this thinking. One of the scriptures that illustrates it quite well, I think, is in Ezekiel chapter 33. 
You see, Ezekiel was a prophet of God in the, in the ancient world of Israel. And the Israelites, although they'd been given the law of Moses and they'd been given the truth of God, of God's law, they were disregarding the law of God and they took idols and raised idols up above the Most High. They began to bow their knee to these idols. These, these images were, were representing demons and if they weren't representing demons, they were blocks of wood and they were blocks of stone and were nothing. And the people pushed away from the Lord God and they began to embrace the practices of the Canaanites and they sacrificed their children on the altars of Baal, of Molech. They did all these things because they wanted to be their own God. They wanted to be in control. So they pushed away from God and it grieved the heart of God. But God did not create those people to be that way. They chose that path when offered the path that was given to them, the path of righteousness. And we know that the law can't save, and we know that the Scriptures teach all these things and show how an unable man is to obey God on their own terms. We know that. But nevertheless, there is a freedom of choice involved in this. And God didn't just say this because for a token phrase, He said it because it's true. In Ezekiel 33, 7 to 11, I just want to share the scripture. Ezekiel was given this message by God as the prophet. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. The warning was given because they had an option to turn. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die and, and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways. That wicked person will die for their sin and I will also, and I will hold you ooh, accountable, he's talking to Ezekiel, for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourselves will be saved. That to me sounds all the world like choice. And it is. Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, surely, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? You see the heart of God calling out to them, saying, backhanding them, saying, repent. The prophets were sent because they had the opportunity. God was giving them the opportunity to repent. Did he ultimately know that Israel would not listen and be led off into captivity? Yes, he did. Nevertheless, those people were not put in that mold by God irresistibly. They were put in that mold because of their disobedience. And they faced the consequences. God foreknew that. Yes, he did. And he used that as part of the backdrop to Jesus coming as the Savior of the world to show us the way that we can be saved. Yes, he used that. But those people had a choice. You know. Ah. <sighs> You see, this is why the Lord steered the Apostle Paul, Silas, and Timothy away from preaching to the Asian people in the Asian province and called them to Macedonia. See, God foreknew that there would be fertile ground in the hearts of these people in Thessalonica and in Philippi and in Berea. He knew that. And at the exact right time, he called them and they were obedient. See, whenever God shows up, he manifests his power. And that power is manifest through the working of the Holy Spirit. We don't understand how all this works, totally. We can't. But we need to trust the Lord. You see, the Spirit of God wants to work in and through you to take his message to the people that God's put you with. And he doesn't do it without good reason. When you are, you are filled with the spirit of the living God and he takes you and he places you in a place and he tells you, as we see in the scriptures, to share 
the love of Christ through word and through deed with the people around us. There will be an impact. You might not see how it's impacting, but there will be an impact because he's called you and you are part of his everlasting plan. So don't be discouraged if you don't see everything happening the way you think it should. God has a plan, just like he had a plan for the Thessalonians, just like he had a plan for the people in the church in Sardis, which is in Asia, those, and Ephesus. It wasn't the time for Paul and Silas to go back to those places. There was another time that they went. God's timing is perfect. He's put you here in 100 Mile, in this assembly, with these people for reasons of his own sovereign will. And it's a beautiful thing to be in the hands of God because never will he leave us, never will he forsake us. He will be with us even until the very end of the age, even if it's tough. Even if you being here is the toughest thing that you've ever had to face because of the circumstances that are around you. Have no fear. The Lord God is with you. Love God with the love that he's given you. And love others with the love that he has filled you with. Because that's his plan. That you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. See, even though Paul was chased away from Thessalonica by an angry mob several weeks after he shared the gospel, the Lord took the seed and brought it to life. And look what happened. And Paul's like, praise you, Jesus, for the work that you've done in Thessalonica with all these believers. This is something that's supernatural. Thank you, Lord. And I'm so glad you Thessalonians have responded to the gospel with open hearts. Oh, what a glorious thing to see God's plan of salvation unfold in the lives of other people. Paul says this, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with joy given in the Holy Spirit. And you, to the Thessalonians, he says, you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only to Macedonia, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith of in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about this. For they themselves report of what kind of reception you gave us. They tell us how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven who he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Praise the Lord. You see, that was the message given to them out of joy from the apostle's heart. And the same can be said here to those who respond to the gospel, who have given their hearts out to the Lord. God's doing something wonderful in the hearts of the people in his, his local church here. I can see it. God's preparing to do great things through his people. Not because there's something special about us, but because he wants us to walk in obedience to him and he's promised that he'd be with us. If we're walking in step with him, we're going to see things happening in the kingdom. And this church here, we don't want to be all about us. It's not all about me and you and our comfort here. It's not. It's about Jesus and about the mission that he's given to go into the world and preach the gospel to every living creature, seeing people baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, coming to new life in Christ. And that happens here. And it happens outside of our footprint. May our footprint leave ripples that go across this globe. We don't support missionaries to appease God and, and, and to do something so that makes us more favorable with God. We support missionaries because we love and God has put his love in our hearts so that we love and we want to see those people in the different countries of the world come to know Jesus. Oh, behold the love of God. We can be part, partners with the Lord in his good work. This is the Lord's church. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's God's church. 
And the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Why? Because Satan is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. So don't be afraid. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge the Lord in all your ways, and he will make your path straight. He'll make it clear. And the gates of hell will fall. Yep, there's going to be demons that are going to kick and scream and try and keep us from getting into those fortresses that people are held captive. You guarantee it. But the gates of hell will fall as we triumph and go forward in Jesus' name because God has ordained it. Amen.